Good morning everyone. It's been a wonderful morning so far. I'm full of apprehension that I won't be able to get as much into the 20 minutes as the previous speakers did. But I'm going to open with a Venn diagram that I usually use at the beginning of my lectures for the Police Academy. And, it, and it's this. It's saying everybody who's at this symposium is already an expert in your own area. We know that. That's why we called it a symposium and that's where we directed our advertising. So everybody has expertise. When I'm at the Police Academy, I'm saying it's investigation or pros um, prosecution. And, and whatever your area of expertise is, please uh, read that in there. Child protection, I'm sure. Um, and I'm not here to tell you anything about how you do your job. I know you do your job to the best of your ability. I have the luxury here of telling you how I do my job and what I've learnt over the last 40 years of working in the area of child sexual abuse prevention. And so I've got a therapeutic emphasis. Um, so I'm coming from a different place from a lot of you, not all of you, but quite a few of you. And certainly I was when I was at the police academy. And so some of the things I say may be confronting, some of the things you might totally disagree with, and uh, other things you, we might have in common. Uh, but I ask you to just hear me and take on board anything that I say that you find valuable for your work and forget anything that I say that you don't find helpful. <laughs> and just bear in mind that we have one very, very important thing in common, is we all want to keep children safe. So the protection of children is the whole topic of being here. And to keep children safe from child sexual abuse is the thing that unites us. And we probably should, you know, for a Venn diagram, probably should have lots of these. But that's the framework from which I'm coming. Um, so I'm not telling you how to do your work. I'm telling you what I've learnt. And basically, my background is this, that uh, at 23 years of age, I'd done my master's in clinical psychology and my first post, it was actually in my master's with Peter Dunlop, um, uh, where my first posting was to Fremantle Prison. And I worked at Fremantle Prison for 10 years over the next 15 years. And truly, that is where I did my major learning. All the six years at university had prepared me as best UWA could do. But I realised the minute I got there that I knew very little. So, so for 10 years, I worked mainly with men. And of course, they were offenders of very serious kinds. And actually, for that first 10 years, I thought my speciality was working with homicide because I saw every single person who was in prison for murder um, over that 15-year um, period, I made it my job to. I either saw them in depth for therapy or I saw them once to make sure that I'd seen everybody who was in there. So I thought I was in there to deal with violence and the underlying issues that led to violence in later life. Because I know that nobody is born to become an offender, either a child sexual offender or a homicide offender. We're born as children, and what happens to us along the way is what influences us. So in that first um, period of time working mainly with men, to be honest, I mainly worked with victims. You might think I was working with offenders, but I sat down and started to listen to the life stories of all the men that I saw over that time period. And 90% of them had suffered serious sexual abuse, violence, or neglect. It was almost universal. And during that time period as well, this was in the 70s to 80s, I also realized that 90% of men in prison have experienced sexual abuse or, or exposure to violence, that trifecta of damage in childhood. And 90% of women in mental hospitals had experienced it. And I also worked in um, a women's prison for three months at Bandy Up, and I found the same picture there. So it, there's an overwhelming overrepresentation of this issue in our institutions, as we know. 
um, thanks to the Royal Commission. But I think we have ignored the fact that in, in prison, people come there from child sexual abuse in their own background. So when I was first working, I discovered, as I said, child sexual abuse, violence and um, neglect. And often neglect was the most damaging because if you think about it, child sexual abuse is a relationship that's gone wrong. Violence is relationship gone wrong. Neglect is an absence of relationship and that's really killing to the spirit of a child who needs nurturance and attachment to be able to develop uh, properly. So what I discovered while I was working there was that these adults that I was working with had experienced all this negative adversity in their childhood and often their offending was actually not, it was their adult offending, but it was actually the inner child or the damaged child within that person acting out. So my first insight was that most of the people who committed murder had actually committed murder from the point of view of the impotent rage of a two-year-old. I don't think we ever get any angrier than when we're two <laughs> because we know what we don't like and we just want that threat not to be there. We don't care who we hurt ourselves or other people. And of course we know how to handle two-year-olds. We give them structure, nurturance, we listen to them. However, when you've got a berserk two-year-old in an adult body with a broken bottle or a weapon, that's how homicides and lethal behaviours occur. So that was my first learning. So I did that for uh, 10 years. I think over that time period I would have worked in depth with only about Five. I was racking my brains last night in the middle of the night thinking what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, how many of those people that I saw were actually child sexual offenders? But probably there were more than that because I noticed that um, when I talked to those who had sexually offended against children, they didn't remember their childhood. They didn't remember that they had been abused. And often, the victimisation that they had inflicted on a child, the age of the victim and the type of behaviour, actually taught me more about that offender's background than they actually remembered or could tell me. So that was my first learning with sex offenders in that situation. Um, what I found was that um, they didn't recognise. So it's not everybody has pain in their childhood. None of us escape that. But the thing that differentiated those who were victims from those who became offenders, and it was a very small number who became offenders out of all those victims that I saw, the thing that differentiated them was that they didn't actually know they'd been abused in childhood. And they didn't know for usually a variety of reasons. One reason was they had totally blanked out their whole childhood. I remember. Uh, a man saying to me when I said, oh, how was your childhood? And he said, oh, don't give me that bullshit about my childhood. Nothing wrong with my childhood. I'm just evil. And, and I said, oh, okay, well, tell me your earliest memory. And he said, I don't remember anything. I said, well, what's your earliest memory? He said, eight years of age when the police came and carted me off from home, took me to boys' home, where incidentally he was abused. And, uh, and I said, oh, your childhood couldn't have been that great then. And later, after years of therapy, he remembered that when he was four, he was abused. And, uh, but he hadn't remembered that. He blocked it out, and a lot of people block out that trauma. And in fact, when I worked with women, which was what I did next, who were adult survivors of child sexual abuse, I found the same thing. In childhood, we do block out those things that are too painful for us. Yvette mentioned it as well. So, so one reason they didn't remember was blocking it out. The other was that everybody in their family was doing it. It was normal sexual behaviour to have um, sexualised behaviour amongst children, between adults. It was going on in their family network and they didn't know that it was wrong because they learnt it from when they were very little and they never questioned it. The third reason was the neglect reason, that um, while they were growing up, often the sexual abuse occurred in the context of the only relationship they had where they were special, where they were the focus of love and attention. And that came in a sea of violence or neglect. 
And so those three factors showed up to me in the difference between why don't all the victims go on to become offenders? Why is it only a small number? And so not remembering that you're abused is one of those trigger factors. There's also a very important other one, which is gender. If, if the gender of the person who had offended against them was the opposite sex, they were not at risk of offending. If the gender of a person who abused them was the same sex, they were at risk. So to just say that simply, girls are mostly abused by older boys or men, and they don't grow up at risk of offending and have great difficulty understanding offending, and uh, become repeat victims. That's their risk and that's the damage. And boys mainly grow up abused by older boys and men. And so they are at risk. Not all of them go on to offend, but that gender identification puts them at risk of acting out at certain times in their life. And, um, and I also met many men who had been abused as children by older girls or women, and they weren't at risk of offending, but they were very like my women survivors that I'd actually worked with. And, you know, I'm still at my first point where I worked with the prison uh, male population first. <laughs> then I worked in private practice and saw a lot of women who were the adult survivors of child sexual abuse. And that's actually where this diagram came to the fore as well, because many women would come to me and they'd say, I was abused in childhood, but I didn't remember it. And suddenly I'm thinking about it and it's in my face. And often it was because they'd just got married or they'd had a baby or their child had reached the age they were when the abuse happened to them. And suddenly, whoosh, it was coming out. And they'd say to me, I think I'm going crazy. And I'd say to them, you're not going crazy, you're going insane. It's actually better to recognise it. Because you see, when we're children, if something bad happens, we lock it away and act as if it hasn't happened. That's a defensive and a survival response. If it happens again, we lock it away. So um, by the time a child is full of these locked away <coughs> things, it, in early childhood, it's, it's a survival energy and a uh, recognition. But in adulthood and adolescence, it's not helpful because there's less energy to relate to the outside world and things happen that trigger stuff that we've remembered and out it comes. And so I was saying to them, it needs to come out, and the two helpful things are that your psyche is saying to you, you couldn't bear to see this before, but you can now. And you're ready to integrate and deal from that. So my thesis really, both for all victims, is healing is necessary. And unacknowledged pain is what causes damaging behaviour. If we can acknowledge and deal with that pain, then we're a lot better off. And, um, and so many of the women who were remembering their abuse, their children were the age they were when it had happened to them. Now, I'm wanting to tell you, because people do want to know, the Safe Care story. Safe Care was closed in 2009. It existed for 20 years as a family counselling service. And then it was closed. And after it closed, we had continual streams of people wanting the program. And so there's a group of my colleagues, and Mercurio Cicchini has a little notice board out there and a list of people who work in this area. There are free booklets, so this is a little plug for if you want to know the people who specialise in working in the area <laughs> of treatment of offenders and of, of um, child sexual abuse uh, victims and families, then uh, there's a list in there. And uh, I'm very grateful for a, um, a former uh, member of the child abuse unit, um, a, a, a person who gave me a phone call and said, we're really desperate looking for places to treat offenders. Too many of them are killing themselves. We've lost four in the last two months and somebody gave me your name. And I said, send them to us, all the men who come to us who are charged are suicidal. They need to know there's a place to go and a way to deal with this that can make them come out the other end strong and safe. And, um, and he said, and that's why I'm not quoting his name, he said, I have to tell you I'm a bit alone on this. Most people are saying things like good riddance to bad rubbish. And I said to him, well, you're right and they're wrong. 
because it's far worse for the victims and their families if the offender commits suicide. It's much better if they can acknowledge the responsibility of what they've done and face the consequences. So thanks to the police force, I have been having a stream of referrals of suicidal men, mostly for child internet pornography, but also for child sexual abuse. And they've been going through our program for five years and we haven't had any suicide since then. So it's definitely an intervention that's needed. Now I'm going to whiz through this and I know most of you know all this information. So I'm not going to go over the stuff you know already, except that the logic of treatment is that if, this, if child sexual abuse is an underlying issue in a whole range of problems, including further victimization and next generation offending, then clearly if we can provide treatment for all victims of child sexual abuse, we will do something about stopping the further victimization and next generation offending. Now, I've already mentioned that only some victims of child sexual abuse become offenders, but almost all offenders who offend against a child have been victims in their own childhood. And one of the reasons that doesn't show up in the research literature is people make the mistake of asking people whether they were abused. And I've already told you what I discovered in the prison, which is if you don't know you were abused, you're more at risk. So self-report doesn't work. Frida Briggs' study was unique in that it used structured interview and it asked these sex offenders what their first significant sexual experience had been. And she found in the case of those who'd been sexually abused in childhood, who'd become child sexual offenders, 93% of them reported child sexual abuse, even though they didn't know it. Um, and I've already mentioned the gender influence, so I won't talk about that. But how do we measure what's in the best interest of children in all this? And the thing is, we have to protect them from abuse. We have to heal the trauma and, if possible, restore or even establish for the first time healthy relationships. We also need meaningful consultation. And any of us who work in the child protection area will know how rarely that happens for victims especially child victims, do not know the impact of their disclosure until afterwards. And also a statistic Polly Ann says is that often the, the average length of time between being a victim and disclosing it that the Royal Commission found was 22 years. Mm -hmm. So it's too late. Anyway, how do we achieve this? And this slide is to illustrate what a 12-year-old child in the children's program at Safe Care said. Are you sure you won't do it again, Dad? And um, I brought what she had on the back as well, which is a little scribble picture of saying, Are you sure you won't, Dad? And here's Dad saying, Yes, I'm sure, which is what her wish was. We need to stop the offending and the risk of offending, but we don't necessarily need to destroy a family or remove a loved caregiver or a loved family member. And uh, that can cause unintended consequences that lead to damage later. Um, so our current responses are limited to child focus and we've seen an excellent uh, demonstration of that from Holly Ann. You can see why we invited her. Um, and the criminal justice system focus and we're gonna hear a bit more about that from Dave who's coming up next. But in actual fact, it's an adult responsibility to keep children safe and the way in which we're handling it now is inadequate. It's not that it's inappropriate. The criminal justice system is needed, but it's not needed and it's not coping with the vast amount of this um, problem that exists in our society and in our community. We need to provide more treatment. The treatment provided is totally underfunded. Well, it's just not available. It's just under-resourced and it's shocking. So we need a treatment and prevention response and what Safety did for 20 years was it allowed offenders to take responsibility for what they'd done and to come into a treatment program. This is the funny little um, ad we made. In 1989, um, Les Harrison, it would be wrong of me not to mention him, rang me up and said, Christabel, is it true that if a man says he has a problem, he's afraid he's going to offend against a child or he's offended against a child and he wants help, that there's nothing available? And I said, yep, it's true. There's a handful of practitioners who do this work and we're very ad hoc. Nobody's trained us in particular except our clients. We've learnt from them. He said, don't you think that's wrong? And I said, yes. 
And he said, I've got 30,000 from the Child Abuse Task Force. I'm going to set up a community-based treatment program for sexual assault in families. Will you join my board? So I did, and we made up this funny poster. And basically, this poster says, if your child isn't safe from you, ring this confidential phone line and get help. And in that first year, in 1989, 80 of the phone calls we got were men who admitted they had a problem and came into a two-year treatment program that we devised. Now, what I'd also said to Les was, if people are convicted, there's nowhere for them to go either, because it was only in 1989 that we set up the in-prison treatment program for sex offenders. So what we found was that 80 of the men put up their hands and they came, and 60% of them were unknown to any statutory authority. They came voluntarily and they engaged. And in a stupid way, we thought, well, great, we're filling a missing link here, we're providing that. Because we thought the women and children would be adequately helped. We soon discovered that this is a specialist area and everybody needs to be helped in the family. So it became a families program within two years and it was called SAFE initially, then it became called SAFE Care. And basically, what we were offering was to work with any offenders who had a problem and who wanted to come into the program, the treatment program. They had a separate treatment program, and then we had a separate program for partners, for adolescent children, and, and for other children within the family. And uh, as Les said, we were struck by the consistency with which offenders stated that they would have sought help when they first offended if there had been somewhere to go. And that's the problem with child internet pornography. The story that's so common about ch child internet porn is men are looking at average uh, socially uh, approved adult porn and they find themselves drawn to younger and younger images and they know that there's something amiss but they don't know what it is. And then suddenly they find they've crossed a line. Now, who do they go to when they've crossed that line? If they put up their hand, they're already criminals and the stigma attached. So what they do is um, they try and say, I'll be stronger, I won't do it. But it's like a very powerful addiction. They don't know why they're doing it, so they're compelled to repeat it. And, um, and then they say, well, if I'm caught, I'll top myself. That's the kind of fallback position, and that's why it is a very hidden problem um, um, in suicide statistics, that there are many people who are so ashamed uh, of what they've done or begun to do that they can't live with it. And I believe it's very like the women survivors of child sexual abuse. The men who don't realise they were abused in childhood are the ones that are drawn to these images. And that funny drawing I did for you, the images they're drawn to tell me what happened to them when they were kids in a way that they can't. They don't know it until they come into a therapeutic program. And we've been going now since 2010, thanks to the referrals from the police, and we've had about 10 programs and 150 people gone through. Oh, more than that, actually. And there I should stop because the screen has intervened. <laughs> and um, I think, I, I just want to say one more thing, though. So the implications of what I'm sharing with you is that we really have under-resourced treatment within our society. We've over-resourced prison, and it's like treating a brain tumour with a hammer. This is a very complicated problem, and there's a spectrum of difficulties that ordinary human beings are suffering, often as a result of their own childhood experiences. So we need treatment for anyone who fears they might offend, and we need uh, additional help apart from the criminal justice system for those who have offended. So that's the conclusion of this. And one, somebody said to me, how did this symposium come about? Well, it was really inspired, and so was the title, by an article in The Economist, which is quoted on your brochure. When I read this article that said, paedophilia, shedding light on a dark field, understanding sexual attraction to children is essential if we have to keep children safe, and it was about Stop It Now in UK, which I've visited and shared with, and they thought safe care was brilliant. I thought, if when The Economist says it, and when intellects are beginning to get that picture, the time has come. And that's why this symposium is about an idea whose time has come. <laughs>